record. <laughs> Good morning, it's Summer, and welcome back to the Constellation 2020 Green Room. She reports on the entertainment industry. He's an industry insider. Welcome, Ramsey and Hef. <laughs> I'm never going to live that one down, I guess. Yeah. Gotta love autocorrect. Well, we, we, we like to start by getting you guys in a good mood and loosened up so we can have some fun. Great. Well, guess, but Chuck, tell them our actual names. <laughs> oh, oh, you guys have actual names? Oh, I, I, I'm very sorry. This is Chrisula and Maury. No. Uh, <laughs> Jeff's wife is Grisula. And uh, Maria, I see. Maury is, is my husband. Yes. Uh, yes. But at least I got their names correct. So we're we're approaching the right place. Yes. So this is <laughs> Jeff Gomez down. from Starlight Runner. Jeff Gomez, industry, yes. Yes. He is an industry insider. This is Randy Dawn, who reports on the industry. The I'm, I'm an industry outsider. Yes. <laughs> and the thing they both have in common, of course, is fandom. So... I guess the question I want to start with is, is there still an industry given COVID? When will there be, you know, when, when are they going to run out of the content they've got pre-stored? You know, where are we with all this? Well, they're, already, they're already back in shooting. I mean, there's been stuff that's been shooting for a while. The soap operas went back and have social distancing. And uh, there's a documentary that just is just about to come out with, from Alex Gibney that was filmed in secret, they're telling everybody. Uh, but you can see in the trailer, for example, how they did the interviews because there's a big sheet of plastic with a tiny screen and then the person being interviewed is on the other side. Um, you know, projects are going forward. There's just a lot of testing that's going on. My guess is they're probably not writing a whole lot of crowd scenes. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the industry is happening. It's going to continue happening. And entertainment may not be stopped. <laughs> There are two things I think that are helping the the industry to, to kind of move forward. Uh, one is um, a virtual production, where either you have these um, uh, these studios where actors and uh, can be essentially anywhere in the world because of these rear projections, these LED screens, like in The Mandalorian, um, and also there's uh, international uh, production, which is really kind of got going because other countries handled the situation maybe a little bit differently than the United States did. Um, and um, uh, that's, um, uh, that's, that's why you're seeing uh, uh, the streaming services like, like Netflix and Amazon uh, a, a kind of go without even a glitch because they've had these productions going on all over the world all this time. And then there's the whole the whole additional medium of doing shows through Zoom screens. I mean, or a version thereof. There's an HBO one-off series called Coastal Elites, which is not exactly set up in individual squares, but is five, I think it's five different basically monologues where somebody is talking to somebody on the other side of the screen and it's just one person. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're finding ways to adapt to the new normal. Um, but I, I imagine we will get back to, you know, enormous uh, crowd scenes at some point, even if they are CGI crowd scenes. Uh, and, and eventually people will do entertainment that is taking place in this era. And so therefore it will be appropriate to have <laughs> stadiums where it's cardboard cutouts in the audience. Um, and it will just be time appropriate. So I, I expect that we will, we will see that they'll find ways to get around any road bumps. Okay, so in, in the new stuff that you're seeing, is it is it different or really is the same entertainment industry we had other than being perhaps a little more internationalized as you guys said? I don't know, it's, you know, I mean, things that I'm seeing are largely commenting on the situations today. So it's very much reflective of what we're already going through. And so I'm not really feeling it's new in that way. I sort of feel like if you were trying to tell a modern day story that is literally happening in either 2019 or 2020 and there was no reference to what was going on right now, it would feel very strange. Uh, I think a lot of people have reported watching entertainment and they are a little bit, even if it's stuff that came out way before the virus, that they're seeing more than five people, more than a couple people on the screen and nobody has a mask on and they're all close up, it makes them very anxious. Yes. I haven't personally or had nostalgic. that because, 
<laughs> what, what, what did you say? Or, or nostalgic. <laughs> or nostalgic, right, exactly. Um, I haven't personally felt that, but I can see where people would look at it and say, oh, they shouldn't be doing that. They need to have a mask on or they're just spreading germs. Ew, ew, ew. And it, it brings up a whole, it tells a whole different story than it used to. I'm a member of the Producers Guild of America, the PGA, and uh, we had a, a seminar on special effects uh, just yesterday. And, um, and some of those effects involve things like deep fakes and, and other um, endeavors to simulate physical intimacy <laughs> <laughs> or, or to bring people physically closer together than they actually are. Mm. Uh, this is how far things have, have gotten that they're actually using this and generating crowd scenes and, and things like that that are very realistic. Yeah, so before we got into the interview, we were chatting a little bit. You guys mentioned a, a connection relative to soap operas. <laughs> um, like to get into that a little bit, Randy, you were saying that was one of the first parts of the industry that started trying to recover through this and started filming again? Yeah, I don't, I don't actually have the chronology in front of me, but I know that they were fairly early on. I mean, the thing is that soap operas, I mean, that's a monster. They have an hour, from how an hour or a half hour, depending on which one it is, but an hour or a half hour programming every single day of, you know, for five days a week. They're doing a two and a half hour movie or a five hour movie every week. And it's on the one hand, they have a whole lot of stuff stored up. So they were able to keep that ball rolling longer than a lot of other TV shows. But then, you know, there's a big hole in the in the schedule after that when they're gone and they needed to ramp up again pretty fast. And the joke was, of course, made early on. I think Saturday Night Live even did some sort of sketch about it. they're just going to have, you know, a blow up doll sitting in the in the sofa like this. <laughs> and for a love scene or something. And they haven't done that. I'm not really sure what they're doing exactly. But um, yeah, they, they seem to have gotten back on track as early as you know, late July, early August. I think Days of Our Lives, Bold and Beautiful, Young and Restless, we're all, we're all moving again. And, and with reasonable safety? As far as I know, yeah. I mean, people are getting tested on the sets every day. And they're not, I think they're avoiding too much lip locking. Yeah, there are a lot of rules uh, uh, covering uh, uh, all kinds of production and, and everyone uh, in the business has been pretty uh, close to adhering uh, uh, to those rules. Uh, Randy, what, what's your background with soap, soap opera? I see that you've written uh, a lot about the uh, industry and about the shows. What's the connection? Um, well, I was, I was with Soap Opera Digest for about five years. Um, and I covered a couple of different shows that are no longer in the air, Another World and One Life to Live. And it was really, it was an education. I had certainly watched wow. soap operas when I was in high school. I was a big General Hospital fan. Mm -hmm. They had all sorts of, I'm a great big Anglophile and they had all sorts of Luke British and hospitals. Laura. Luke and Laura. Hey, <laughs> Robert Scorpio. Scorpio. Robert Scorpio, man, Scorpio. the WSB. You know, you want to talk about um, uh, extra textual worlds or anything. Um, my first experience with LARPing was, <laughs> Believe it or not, there was a guy who lived down the street from us and, and he just started, he knew that I was into the whole WSB, which was like the super secret spy bureau on General Hospital and Robert Scorpio. And he would call me on the phone and pretend to be from the WSB <laughs> and give me an assignment to go out into the world, the real world and do stuff. And it wasn't until years later that I'm like, that was LARPing, I think, actually. Um, so, you know, I was, I was a fan when I was a kid and then I went to high school, went, went to college and didn't really have much time for soaps, but then I got a job at Soap Opera Digest, which was like the number one magazine in the industry. And sure. that was a whole other experience, seeing the behind the scenes of how the soaps were made and having a real respect for the actors because they have to do more pages than most normal actors have to on any given day. And they don't get a lot of rehearsal, if any rehearsal, they maybe get blocking time. And, uh, you know, so I really enjoyed that. But at the same time, on a narrative level, the repetition of it all, the very mm. predictive, the, the predictability of it, I found frustrating because you do have two and a half hours to five hours every week to tell a really complex, interesting textual story and instead it's the same thing over and over again where you cheated on me and we've been married for five minutes but now you're lying to me and oh look the stranger who came from out of and from out of town is actually your long lost child and <laughs> there was one soap i was covering where uh 
there was a main character and a, a woman was in uh, the annoying woman in town turned out to be the daughter she never remembered giving birth to and I'm like all right look um so you know it it, it it felt like it was a waste in terms of the kinds of stories they could be telling versus the stories mm. they were telling and that kind of led me out of that industry but then I went into other I went I wrote for variety and LA Times and still do and so so Randy what what's uh what what was interesting or intriguing uh, about uh soap operas to me was that I I loved long form narrative mm -hmm. uh, particularly um, serial uh, narrative, and there wasn't, if you think about it, there there wasn't that much on uh, American television that was like that, except for soap operas. Yeah, it was and, very self-contained episodic stuff for a lot of them. Right, episodes. right. I, I found them kind of, you know, not terribly interesting until that stretch of, of uh, 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 General Hospital, where it became almost like a science fiction serial. Yeah. Um, do you know what was in their minds when when they switched into this whole thing with Scorpio and Luke and Laura and the Prometheus formula or all that? What, what yeah. was? What were they thinking? You know, I confess, I didn't cover that show. I was a fan of that show. I did not cover that show. So my my resolution on that show is not really good. Um, I think that they just had these characters that they really liked and they wanted to put them through different paces and then they then maybe there was the predictable way to go. Uh, you know, Luke and Laura were very much beloved, so they weren't going to just break them up 30 seconds after they finally right. got together. They, they had to give them an them. adventure. Right. And of course, if once you bring Br British people onto the show or Australian people onto the show, well, that must be intriguing and James Bondian. So that probably is where things came from. And that's where they headed. So um, uh, uh, soap opera and the the uh, Latin version telenovela. Yeah, you were a fan um, of that, aren't you? Uh, uh, became very interesting to me, um, and and actually dovetailed with some of my work. This is uh, some lesser known stuff, uh, uh, Chuck, uh, uh, that that I've been involved with. Um, uh, a soap opera um, when it tackles uh, uh, socially relevant issues mm -hmm. and progressive issues, particularly outside of this country, really have the capability of having a powerful impact on, on society. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I began to study uh, how that's possible um, uh, by looking at uh, uh, Latin uh, soap operas that talked about the plight of um, uh, domestic workers, uh, for example, Simplemente Maria uh, mm. was about a domestic worker who was abused by the people who were her bosses and, and so forth. And um, at, at night, she, um, uh, she went to night school uh, to get an education and ultimately is able to escape because she can get a, you know, a, a, a better job. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this uh, sent millions and millions of women to night school across South America. Uh, it really had a, an impact. And so uh, when we do our uh, transmedia population work, our, our geopolitical work, mm -hmm. uh, uh, telenovelas, soap operas are, are part of uh, the, um, uh, the, the, one of the platforms that we work with. Uh, it's really mm -hmm. intriguing how, how powerful it can be. Yeah, I, I, I certainly remember that while I was at Digest, we would see these articles come along and occasionally write something about how, you know, women in Afghanistan were motivated to take different social measures because these, the, the, the soap operas they saw over there were reflective of that, or in Turkey, I think it was a very big deal as well. Um, do, you, do you get the sense that uh, international soap operas are more concentrated on that social change aspect and are able to maybe have a bigger effect on that than maybe soap operas in America are today? Um, in, in, all honesty, in all honesty, not terribly much more so than uh, uh, American soap operas have been. And, and I, I, I give them a little credit. Um, uh, American soap operas integrated their casts uh, uh, fairly early. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they um, in, included Latinos um, and and, uh, and you know and talked about progressive issues, pregnancy, abortion, uh, uh, things like that, in in, um, in fairly uh, progressive ways. Mm -hmm. So it's really um, every so often uh, uh, something like that happens. Right. Uh, uh, Chuck knows that. Um, is it okay to call you Chuck, Charles? It's okay to call me Chuck. <laughs> Jeff's known me no, since no, Jeff. No, no, no. It's it's when it's I met you, Jeff. You were sixteen. <laughs> 
Uh, Is that about right? We, we met in December of 1979. I was 14 years old. You were wow. 14. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we've known each other for a little while. A little while. <laughs> you can uh, call me Chuck. <laughs> Uh, uh, Chuck knows that um, that story uh, is just really important to me. Uh, it tended to be genre of fiction, like fantasy and science mm -hmm. fiction. Um, but um, the, the lessons that I learned uh, in story, I took very seriously. For some reason, I, I believed it. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and so the, the, the methods that these characters use to get out of situations or to improve themselves or pr improve their communities, I really kind of embraced them and used them to climb out of some chaotic uh, uh, situations of my own and, and um, uh, you know, uh, uh, find a career that I loved and, and fulfill some wishes. Yeah. So very uh, important to me. Uh, Chuck also, by the way, introduced me to um, uh, something called bulletin boards. <laughs> Gosh, um, wow, yeah. I, I tell a few years story. ago. I tell this story quite often. It, it looked like a uh, a typewriter taped to a, a black and white TV set plugged into his phone jack. And I was like, <laughs> what are you doing with that thing? Yeah. And he said, well, I, I can't play with Jeff Gomez Dungeons and Dragons all the time. Sometimes I have to uh, go on the bulletin boards to play. And, and, and I said, can you please explain this to me? <laughs> and... Um, and as as uh, as Chuck was telling me about the fact that you could essentially play Dungeons and Dragons through your telephone line with uh, dozens of other people uh, through text, um, mm -hmm. uh, I started imagining how to how I would build a story universe uh, uh, through the internet and uh, connect the things that I love in novels and TV shows and movies and games uh, with the glue that that the internet. Uh, could be, and that became transmedia storytelling. Okay. Uh, so uh, Chuck was inspirational to me. <laughs> <laughs> so can you explain transmedia storytelling a little bit more to you know everybody who's watching this? To me, how that all works? Sure, sure. Um, transmedia storytelling is is another way to 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 talk, describe nerdy storytelling, mm -hmm. <laughs> where where essentially. Um, in, instead of simply repeating a story on different media platforms, you know, there was the novel, there was the television series that was basically the novel or the movie, and then the comic book, it all told the same uh, story. Transmedia um, uh, all takes place in the same story world, but is manifesting different aspects of that world across different media. Mm -hmm. That's where you're getting the current Star Wars universe. Right there's the right. Mandalorian on Disney Plus. There's the movies. There are the novels. There are the comic books. All of them are telling different stories. All those stories are set in the same continuum, the same right. universe. Uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is doing that now. Um, uh, you can say that Harry Potter is is jumping across um, a, a film and and other media uh, with different aspects of of its story world. Right. Um, uh, there's more and more of it happening now. Doctor Who is undergoing a massive transmedia implementation uh, uh, currently. And what I'm working on right now, Ultraman, is, is kind of a planned uh, uh, transmedia implementation. So really what, what it does is it, um, it, it's the gift that keeps on giving. If it's a universe mm -hmm. and if it has something relevant to say across time and across space, um, you can keep at it for a while, and um, and in Hollywood, you want your your dollar to stretch. You 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 want your intellectual property to persist because it's so rare to have a big blockbuster to to have a big hit, and transmedia storytelling is one of the ways to do it. Yeah, and there's a lot, there's a lot of aspects I'd love to to touch on with that, but one one thing that keeps just jumping to my mind is that um, I feel like this is in response, at least in some part, to the I the audience is becoming more sophisticated. You know, we're, we're, we're seeing, um, it's not just that the stories are more complex, but the audience can handle them. And I think, for example, maybe we don't need to see yet another film that's an origin story that we've seen four million times. I mean, I, if they made the origin story of Spider-Man one more time, I mean, come on. 
Um, but you don't need to see um, uh, Martha um, Martha's pearls uh, fall from yeah. uh, Bruce Martha Wayne's uh, pearls fall. Right, exactly. I was going to say the Batman, Batman. storyline. I mean, we've heard that so many times, and I sort of feel like this: the audience, while they may go to that sort of thing because it'll have the latest and the greatest stars in it. I love the idea that we can we can go five, six, seven steps to the side or or back or forward and expand that concept, you know, tell the stories around that main story rather than the same story we've heard a million times. And one of the key things- Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I'm sorry, Charles. I was gonna say one of the key things around it and part of what Jeff does is the continuity concept that goes Mm -hmm. with that. Because the problem with expanding across a billion things is like you said, fans are more sophisticated. Mm-hmm. If you put out that lunchbox and there's a purple sky behind a character who's only ever been on Mars, <laughs> there's going to be 100,000 complaints on the internet about it. <laughs> right. And the way you keep all those things going so people enjoy that expanded universe is by respecting it. Yeah, and I was, that was the other half of what I was, I was saying with all the questions that I had is like, once you expand that universe, canon becomes more and more important and people who are writing about it need to have a, a, a fluency in the details because the audience already has that fluency or will have that fluency. And if you don't know what you're stepping into, you're going to you're going to write something that's not satisfying to them and they're not going to pay attention. So one of the most uh, renowned aspects of, of my job um, it are these mythology documents um, mm-hmm. where we take the totality of the universe, the characters, the locations, the devices, uh, the way that magic or super science actually works, uh, uh, the chronology, and we uh, put them in a single massive volume and we turn them into big coffee table books uh, that are super, super secret and only a few people at the movie studios have them. Right. Uh, uh, we've they call done, them Bibles, I think, and t- at least in TV they do. Right. We we distinguish these as mythologies because um, because in addition to um, uh, uh, to the encyclopedic aspect, there is also uh, the essence. Um, what what is the fundamental messaging of this universe? Where is this universe going? Uh, mm-hmm. And and what does it have to say? Um, uh, that's actually kind of my favorite part of, of the work that I do. I get to drill down and, and uh, speak with these uh, franchise visionaries um, uh, about what it is that fundamentally they're trying to communicate with Avatar or Pirates of the Caribbean or Men in Black. Um, and that's a lot of fun. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting because um, I was actually just talking to my husband this afternoon. We were talking about comics and he said he would love to get more into the comics worlds, but he disliked that they never actually have an end. You know, it's a constant arc that keeps looping and looping. And even if somebody dies, it's like, no, wait a minute. They're, they're actually alive. We've, we've rebooted the whole universe. <laughs> and on the one hand, I, I, we were just talking about the ongoing universes of soap operas. But that is, I think, an issue with, with comics, at least for some people who want to read them. And you know, there's plenty of other things to read, so they just don't get around to them. But I wonder you know, if, if comics haven't maybe put off some, uh, some readers by not having that, that closure, that sense of this means something, this is really important. I think it accounts for the rise of, of Japanese comics, mm-hmm. manga, <clears throat> um, mm-hmm. because Japanese comics, they end. Mm. <laughs> um, sometimes they end with everyone dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, um, uh, there is a, a, a completeness uh, to, to manga. It can go for many volumes. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, this is true long form storytelling. And there could be uh, prequels and sequels and sequels. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, uh, but they do eventually end. And, um, and usually quite spectacularly. And, um, and more and more uh, Americans ha- have over the past a decade or so been exposed to that, both manga and anime. Mm-hmm. And they've come to appreciate it and respect endings. Um, yeah. So we're getting, I think we're starting to get a little bit more of that in our popular culture. Yeah, and I think that also just separate from maybe genre or maybe just it less away from sort of the comics universe, I'm finding that you know TV writers. This is something that I've been exploring with uh, showrunners as I've talked to them over the years. 
um, that they're starting to respect the idea of, okay, I've got to have at least some basic, some ending in mind that even if it doesn't get its full run, I could, I could still make it feel satisfying if they give me a final show. I just finished watching the first season of an HBO Max series called Raised by Wolves. Yes. And it's bananas and that's fine. It's Ridley Scott themed all over the place and that's fine. Uh, but then I went and read an article about it and they had the showrunner talking about how he does have a way to wrap things up if he gets five or six seasons, but he also recognizes that if he only gets, gets say, three seasons, it has been renewed for a second season. Mm. If he only gets three seasons, he could move that forward. And I think that that's some chess, that, that's chess that maybe showrunners hadn't been thinking of even five years ago. Um, Not at all. They, they yeah. weren't. Uh, and the reason is because they weren't paid to think that way. Exactly. <laughs> and, and they the weren't. It didn't work that way. And I feel like we also weren't necessarily inviting the kinds of writers who would try and come with that sort of big package. You know, you love him or hate him, David, Damon Lindelof, you know, he's a big picture thinker. And if he had started off on, say, Lost, we might have ended up with a very different Lost than we ended up getting. But they came, he and Carlton came in, I think, like midway through. And I remember interviewing them about halfway through the run of Lost saying, now look, you do know where this is going, right? You have, you figured, and, and they were sort of like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 you really, you, don't, <laughs> you need to understand, you Please? have to know where this is going because why are people going to invest? hours upon hours upon hours to find that it's just, you know, wah, wah at the end. And this is, this is where I think the, you need to have the smart writers and to meet up with the sophistication of viewers who are willing to go with them on this trip, as long as they know there's a, there's a destination. Randy, let me tell you something. And it's shocking. Um, <laughs> the, Hollywood still doesn't think this way. Mm. So, so the this last uh, trilogy of Star Wars pictures uh, was in no way planned as a trilogy, mm -hmm. as a complete story. Um, uh, the um, the mentality was auteur driven, mm. which I, I'm the first person to love auteurist theory and 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 the great films to come out of that. Uh, but Star Wars, <laughs> it, you, maybe you should think about where this is going. In, in movie, you know, seven, so that eight and nine make a lick of sense. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, well, I, no. yeah. I think you can marry auteur with series if, it, if both are strong enough. Like, I think that for me, the strongest Harry Potter film is the one that Alfonso Cuaron oh, directed. Of course. It's got a look, it's got a feel, the story matches the director, and yet it's got a very strong directorial feel to it, but it also fits within the series. Whereas if you just get a like, oh, well, look, this is the latest hot director who has an idea, who has a vision. Let's throw him into Star Wars. That's not a good marriage. You're, you're absolutely right. It's why the Marvel films uh, tend to work so well. You can feel the imprint of, of a lot of those directors on the films mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're allowed to be themselves because the, the story world uh, exists overall. Um, uh, we are, you know, in service uh, to these characters in this mythology, even if what you're seeing and the style and the tone uh, come from my auteurist uh, uh, perspective. Yeah. Uh, the best of both worlds. I I'm going to jump in for a second. By the way, I'm having the best time just sitting here being an audience watching you guys interview each other. This has actually been great. Uh, we are going to run close toward the end of time. So let me immediately say I'd like to invite you guys back and continue the conversation. We do have another five minutes or so. Sure. Um, and I did want to get back to something you were talking, Randy, about things having an end. But the other thing that was kind of buried in there that I'm also very invested in is the idea of things have a stake. Mm -hmm. You're talking about they died, but they didn't. And right. I think that's been a huge problem with comics and a lot of media. Um, I was just watching something where they're talking about Fast and the Furious. They brought in a one shot character in, Trope, in Tokyo Drift and he died and the audience loved him. So they started trying to talk about stuff before so they could work him into the story as if he'd always been there just to keep, you know, <laughs> popularity going. And that is part of the problem mm -hmm. is that, you know, oh, we're going to kill this character. It will have stakes and all have meaning. Oh, a million fans are ticked off. We're going to bring the character back. You know, or yeah. this actor is really popular. He just had a hit movie. We need to work him back into the series. <laughs> and I, I, I think that's 
also killed a lot for a lot of fans is when the stakes disappear. Mm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's, you know, when we talk about auteurs, we often are referring to directors. I think it'd be nice if we were start, if we started thinking about auteurs in the way, in the way of, you know, I know an auteur is generally a writer director, but to put a little more emphasis on the writer aspect of that, you know, you're doing a visual medium, so you want it to look in a specific way, but you also need to have somebody who understands the mechanics of the story and stakes are huge in that. If you're just introducing people willy nilly because they might sell a few more tickets, you're also selling your story out because people don't buy into it. And the most satisfying stories are the ones where you create the stakes and this is important and this is going to have finality to it. And if everything out, everything is, you know, oh, she looked dead for five minutes, but wait a minute, we can bring her back. Uh, you know, it's, then why should I invest? I'm not, I'm not excited. I'm just waiting another five minutes until you tell me why she's back. I, I can't get emotionally involved in this. Yeah, it, it's very frustrating. I was reading a, a work in process for another writer as a beta reader. And what I had to say to them was, I'm not reading anymore because your hero is so much more confident than your villains that I don't need to be here. Wow. <laughs> there, there's literally no stakes. Yeah. One side is wildly unprepared and not ready to be here. And the other side is super confident and they're the good guys. Mm -hmm. I feel completely fine that the story is going to end well. I don't need to read it. <laughs> I'm actually having a, a similar kind of response. Starlight Runner gets in a lot of scripts, my company, because of course we're keeping track of what's going on and, and the studios are our clients. And um, I'm actually kind of disappointed lately, particularly for scripts for younger people where the, the moral of the story is, well, just be yourself and everything will be all right and, and, and so forth. But there there is no, uh, instruction. There's there's no path to to being yourself and not getting beat up, or being yourself and not uh, 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 feeling completely alienated from society. What is it that you have to actually do to 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 have both? No, because it's because it's also not satisfying to tell the young people who are going to watch the film. Look, you may not actually be able to be yourself until you're in your forties. <laughs> that's not you know the, uh, wisdom systems I, i'm i'm interested in in uh writers who are are good enough to integrate the actual process the practicality of moving from one state of mind to another state of mind successfully mm -hmm. and to become successful as a result um right. I, I, we're just not seeing uh that much of that and and that's i wish i i wish there'd be more yeah, I think I think you need to show that your characters earn where they get to. And yeah. a lot of the time that's either completely elided over or it becomes a montage. And it's like the actual hard work of getting to be this thing. I mean, again, earning it means not just getting a check. You know, earning means you have to show up and do the work and repeat and repeat and repeat Precisely. until you become a different person. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, we're going to ask each of you, uh, why don't you start, Randy, first, just one minute. What are you working on next? What do you want to plug? What do you want to talk about? And like I said, I will have you guys back probably in December so we can continue this because this is great. Sure. Okay. You got a minute, Randy. Tell us. Uh, let's see. I am currently, I, I, I have a story with my agent and it's being shopped around. So maybe there's a good chance. It's called Tune In Tomorrow and it takes place in the soap opera world, but it is a fantasy soap opera world where the mythical characters are running the soap but the humans are starring in it. So we'll see if that goes somewhere. I am also working on a new novel, um, which is about uh, the empowered. It's um, only the women get the, super, get, the, get, the, get the superpowers in this universe. And we're gonna find out why and what it's like in that universe. And that's the novel I'm working on right now. Um, but in terms of actual fiction coming out, I've got a story coming out towards the end of the year in Dim Shores 2 called Rough Beast Slouching. And it's sort of a dark fantasy horror uh, that takes that uses Irish mythology and the rock and roll world. So that's yeah. exciting for me. Very, very cool. Jeff, love it. Love it. tell us stuff. Um, well, uh, right now I am working with uh, Subaraya Productions and the licensing group to bring Ultraman, uh, the Japanese uh, superhero who fights giant monsters um, uh, to North America. Um, uh, we uh, uh, got a deal with Marvel Comics, and uh, uh, so the, the series has just started uh, at Marvel. It just came out, and um, uh, there's a Netflix anime uh, going on, and there's some more uh, projects in the works. 
Uh, you can uh, uh, check that out at ultramangalaxy.com. Um, and, um, uh, and also, by the way, I'm, I'm doing some coaching um, in my downtime, <laughs> in between <laughs> Ultraman monsters, I'm uh, 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 talking with, um, with people about uh, careers in the entertainment industry. And um, uh, if that interests you, I can help. Uh, you would contact me at jeff at starlightrunner.com or reach me through any of a myriad of social media. I'm an easy Google, Jeff Gomez. <laughs> yes, I know that's not just you. I know some other people in your group are also involved with the mentoring process. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Very, very cool. Danny, <laughs> you there? And with that, we've come once again to the end of the show, before the show that will never start. <laughs>